Welcome to the Horses Equine Innovators Podcast, sponsored by Zoetis. I'm your host, Stephanie Church, Editorial Director at The Horse. Every day, equine researchers are examining new ways to care for and understand our horses. In this podcast series, we talk to those innovators to learn more about their work. Equine herpes virus 1, also known as equine rhinopneumonitis, or rhino, can infect horses and cause disease signs from mild respiratory issues to severe neurologic deficits. It can go undetected in a horse for months to years, only to rear its ugly head and cause outbreaks that shut down facilities and even competitions for quarantine. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Lutz Goring of the University of Kentucky. Dr. Goring is the Lucille Wright Markey Endowed Chair in Equine Infectious Diseases at the University of Kentucky's Gluck Equine Research Center here in Lexington. He's also the World Organization of Animal Health, formerly known as OIE, Reference Laboratory Expert for Equine Rhinopneumonitis. Welcome, Dr. Goring. Thank you for joining us today. Hello there. Thanks for inviting me. We're really happy to have you. So Dr. Goring, when and where did your interest in equine infectious disease and particularly equine herpes virus begin? It's actually a a kind of a funny story. I always had a soft spot for infectious diseases. Um, And um, after I started um, and encountered many, uh, you know, infectious diseases in horses uh, during my um, during my initial days as practitioner, um, I decided to do a residency, um, and I did the residency um, here in um, in Virginia at the Marion Dupont Scott um, Equine Medical Center in Leesburg. I uh, also had to do uh, a master's degree, and with my mentor, um, Dr. Martin Fur, I um, found a topic of interest which um, had been EPM caused by sarcosystis neurona in horses, causing neurologic disease in, um, in horses as well. After completion of my residency, I returned to um, Utrecht University in the Netherlands and uh, where I started my, um, my actual my clinical career at that point. I was asked to pick a topic for my PhD, which, because that's required for um, uh, staying there as a, as a permanent employee. I needed a, a PhD. And so they looked into what I did before and they said, like, you know, sarcosystis neurona, we don't have that here. And this is true. It's not mm-hmm. in, uh, in Europe or other parts of the, the, the world. Basically, it's limited to North America and South America. But my interest in neurologic horses um, was of interest um, to the group there. And so they, they asked me, why don't you do just uh, EHV1 research and neurological herpes, um, as it's called in the Netherlands? And um, yeah, uh, I started my PhD focusing on pathophysiology of um, EHV1 infections. Okay. And another part of this PhD was focused on uh, epidemiology. And while I was, you know, going along in my in my studies there, the uh, Findlay outbreak actually happened here in uh, Findlay, Ohio, at the University hmm. of Findlay. And with all the the data I accumulated for the epidemiology side uh, in the Netherlands, I thought it would be worthwhile to combine presentations. Um, And so I I called uh, Dr. Reed here um, at that time, still at The Ohio State University, and he invited me over to ACVIM to give give presentations at an ad hoc meeting uh, focusing on the Findlay outbreak at that time. And then after this presentation, uh, one of the other participants in this um, in this meeting invited me to a Havemeyer meeting uh, on equine herpes virus um, infection. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Paul Lunn. And uh, mm-hmm. after that meeting, uh, he invited me um, actually to to interview for a clinical position at Colorado State University after completing my PhD. And this is how I ended up at CSU. CSU, we uh, had a very productive time on um, yeah. acute herpes virus um, research, also other infectious diseases, together with uh, a number of, of really dear dear colleagues to me on infectious diseases in the horse. Um, I continued um, I continued this research on EHV1 when I returned to Germany with 
quite a, a number of um, uh, latency research, actually, which is this hibernating phase of equid herpes virus. We talk about that in a little bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that caused interest and allowed me to apply here at the Gluck Center for this basically a research only position here at the Gluck Equine Research Center. Wow, that's quite a winding road and full of, <laughs> and it's also full of many of these um, who's who in infectious diseases, especially neurologic diseases along the way. So here at the Gluck Center, what do your days involve? So uh, days involve I mentioned earlier that this is um, a full-time research position with little teaching, but I, I love to teach, so I will do a few few hours of that as well. But it's, a, it's mainly a research position with a focus on EHV1 um, research. It's uh, my mainstay, or let's say the one leg in, in research, in EHV1 research, is actually latency research. Mm -hmm. um, the other one would be like transmission of virus, um, uh, you know, transmissibility of virus. How does it spread in a host population uh, in a barn? Pathophysiology is still one of my ma main interests. Uh, immunology evaluation of vaccines, for example, are cornerstones of, of my uh, um, research career here at, uh, at Gluck. Days look like, you know, it's you have lab meetings, you organize, uh, you organize your research, um, you um, see where money for further research is coming in, you collaborate with other groups on the same topic, because this is very much multi-center uh, effort to uh, get data available and to combine your resources um, for uh, good data to publish. Dr. Goreen, could you describe the pathophysiology of equine herpes virus or how it affects the horse's body? Herpes virus 1 infection and uh, also a little bit EHV4, which is the little brother of EHV1, mm -hmm. uh, are primarily respiratory tract uh, infections. Mm -hmm. So droplets, either by direct contact or through aerosols, um, they travel from one horse to the other or actually indirect transfer is also possible through uh, fomites, which are hands or uh, other objects where droplets um, landed on and uh, the other horse is picking up these droplets from uh, um, objects or you know, a person's hand or um, clothes or equipment. Um, virus enters the respiratory tract, it enters those epithelial cells, um, the layers, the first layers in the respiratory tract, virus replicates there, it, um, uh, it produces huge amounts of virus which can then ex be ex expelled into the environment again, infecting other horses, but at the same time it causes, um, it causes uh, some cell destruction which allows swelling and um, possibly also colonization of secondary bacterial infections there at these sites. Uh, it causes swelling, um, mild discomfort, rarely cough. But what this virus also does is it colonizes the, um, the lymph nodes uh, with all the immune cells actually in, uh, in lymph nodes. It colonizes them, it replicates in those um, lymphocytes in the cells of these lymph nodes and uh, also increases in, uh, in numbers among these cells. And then at a given point, all of a sudden, this virus starts to uh, seed. It um, travels within those lymphocytes, it travels in the bloodstream, it circulates through the bloodstream, and it is filtered out at um, very specific small blood vessels, in particular of the spinal cord. Hmm. Um, or, and this is something um, you did not mention in your introduction, but EHV1 is also a significant cause of um, abortion in the pregnant mare. Right. And um, so the other location actually where this virus locates is um, at the small vessels, blood vessels of the endometrium, as long as the uterus is um, in, a, in a pregnant stage. So. Um, once the, the virus is in those small blood vessels, it causes a vascular response, an inflammation, inflammatory response of the blood vessels. This um, forces other um, inflammatory cells, white blood cells, to, to leave the, blood, the vasculature and leave, go into, this, into the um, 
tissue beyond the blood vessel. It causes uh, a syndrome of infarction, of thrombosis, infarction, sometimes even bleeding when you look at uh, the spinal cord. And with all that, it, um, it uh, turns into a, um, a disseminated um, disease along the spinal cord, in the spinal cord. And that's why we get this, um, this multitude of, uh, this great variation of clinical signs when it comes to uh, neurologic uh, gait anomalies up to recumbency, depending on the numbers of defects in the spinal cord. Hmm. This is all like reversible. This is not like, you know, um, a death penalty in, in that case. Um, but uh, of course, if we have immensely affected spinal cord, the road of recovery is bumpy and um, can be longer in those um, that are heavily um, affected than in those that are only mildly affected. Indeed. Thank you for explaining that. It's very interesting. So why should horse owners be concerned about this pathogen? Is it an economic thing? Is it a just a welfare thing? Well, this is a, a virus that is quite well distributed among horses, especially in the Western world, in the northern half for sure. Um, we assume that um, uh, about 50% or higher of all our horses and ponies and donkeys have seen this virus um, at one point in their in their life. So this wouldn't be uh, um, tragic if this would be like, you know, an, uh, a finite infection. You once get it and uh, then never again. But this virus has the ability to retreat in the horse. It retreats in uh, lymph nodes, in lymphatic tissue, and it, it also retreats in um, areas of the central nervous system, and in particular, in the trigeminal ganglion. It goes there in hibernation, and uh, so a very quiet uh, phase of uh, viral presence. Mm -hmm. And at some point in a horse's life, a very, I think it's a very rare occasion that reactivation can, uh, can occur, but uh, at some point of a horse's life, um, uh, reactivation may occur again then virus returns to the respiratory tract. It can, um, it can start to replicate again there. It uh, produces virus. It's, it, it expels this virus into the environment and it can affect other horses through this uh, mode of transmission. And that's the very um, dangerous and tricky part of uh, acute herpes viruses. We don't clearly understand what triggers um, this reactivation of virus. And especially, we would be very, very interested in how we can, how can we steer and how can we suppress reactivation effectively so that this, um, uh, this uh, again, this chain of infection does not uh, occur in a, in a herd of horses. Thank you. So could you describe some of the different types of diagnostic testing that are available for herpes, please? Uh, from uh, you know the, the the good old days, let's say from the 80s and the 90s of the of the previous uh, century, uh, mainstay was um, antibody response, um, and the other one was virus isolation. So cultivating growing virus from uh, a specimen um, collected, uh, a specimen collected from the nose, for example, secretion collected from the nose for virus isolation. Antibody is a response of the, um, of the immune system in response to an infection. Um, and antibodies are produced by specific white blood cells, the plasma cells um, or B lymphocytes of the horse. Antibody production does not come overnight. This is a process that takes a few days um, to, um, to get started and be become measurable in the bloodstream. Um, and we uh, count on about, let's say, 10 days, 10 to 20 days um, when we will reach peak antibody concentration after infection. And this peak uh, concentration um, is, uh, so we have to wait. Um, we have to actually take either two samples, an acute sample and then a, um, a convalescent sample. To, um, to see whether we have a specific antibody increase against a specific pathogen. And that would tell us, yes, the host became infected with, um, uh, with for example, EHV1. 
the um, virus isolation is uh, like is um, uh, has been uh, is, is still a, a very valued technique because sometimes you want to have the the, the replicable virus in our petri dish to uh, to uh, do experiments with this virus and see um, about specific groups, but the more uh, and you all probably you all are you have all heard of. Um, uh, modern uh, molecular diagnostics like PCR. Mm -hmm. um, this is the mainstay, um, uh, the mainstay diagnosis currently for EHE1 infection. We look uh, for antigen, which is uh, which are parts of virus that can be uh, detected in specimens like um, nasal secretions, but it can also be um, detected in the bloodstream, but only then when we have uh, this viremic phase, when the virus is actually circulating through the bloodstream, then your blood sample will also be positive. Um, and usually we have the more bang for the buck if we, um, if we consider the nasal secretions testing because that's a, a longer process of, um, uh, of shedding. Okay. Thank you for that in-depth response. That's so interesting, all the different ways you can can find out about this. And some are a lot faster than others, right? So PCR testing is usually an overnight or two days, yeah. uh, including like shipping to a laboratory that can do that. But um, its uh, advantage is also it's easy, it's fast, and um, it detects small amounts of, um, uh, of DNA that belongs to the virus. It does not tell you whether this is live or dead call it that way, but um, we all are aware that, you know, once if we have like a, a certain amount of, uh, if we can detect a certain amount of DNA, we know this horse is shedding and is uh, at the same time contaminating the environment uh, if we are focusing on, uh, on a nasal swab. Okay, thank you. So how do different states and even countries handle equine herpes viruses as far as being reportable so it's it's always the the veterinary uh, body of a of a state or a country that decides whether ehv1 is a reportable um, disease or not i think several states if not the majority of states in the united states ehv1 is a reportable disease but there are also countries in the world where ehv1 is not a reportable disease at all so there are the differences and um, you know the uh, World organizations, for example, they more they, they just collect data from you know where is where are outbreaks. They report outbreaks through also other institutions like the um, the ED, EDCC or the ICC. Um, these are uh, um, collating institutions that uh, that report uh, outbreaks of um, various infectious diseases or even single cases of infectious diseases. But uh, on the other hand, there are many countries where this is not a reportable disease. We've reported on a lot of different equine herpes virus outbreaks. A few of them stand out in my mind because I maybe wasn't familiar with the disease at first and it ended up being like a neurologic situation as in the Finley cases. How has this disease or our understanding of it changed over time? Could you reflect on some of those some of those different outbreaks and the mutations and variants involved? So I rather think that EHV1 uh, neurologic outbreaks, and this may be also because of um, reporting, and you know there has always been like some secrecy about this disease. Nobody wants to be uh, associated with an outbreak on, uh, on, their, uh, on their premises. I think the, um, uh, the first outbreaks actually were reported on um, stud farms. Uh, also neurologic outbreaks, so not only abortion outbreaks, but also neurologic outbreaks. And then, you know, it shifted more to the, um, uh, to, the, to the boarding facilities we have where several horses are boarded and then with usually a ratio of one to one when it comes to owners and a horse. So more owners also on the same, on the same uh, premises. Um, as there are horses, and uh, of course outbreaks can happen. And then, with the introduction of social media, also we had uh, a, an increase in reporting of these outbreaks. Uh, however, it's at that time, like the beginning of 2000, it has not been, um, it has still not been a reportable disease. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So that definitely increased the voluntary reporting on, uh, on the boarding facilities a lot. And it's important because, you know, we want to um, only then can we do research when we know numbers, when we know how, you know, when we can retrospectively look at these outbreaks, how did they uh, um, progress and when were they done and how did they start all these things. So it's very important that there is good reporting of these outbreaks. When it comes to the variants, um, I think this um, uh, all this development in the beginning of 2000, um, in the first decade of the 2000s, um, I think it, this was a, a parallel discovery that the neurological outbreaks are more so and more easily associated with a variant called a D variant mm -hmm. uh, than the abortogenic, the abortion outbreaks um, that were more commonly associated with an N variant outbreak. It's just a little variation in an amino acid in um, the polymerase gene. Um, the polymerase product is actually that um, protein structure that replicates the DNA uh, for the virus. Mm -hmm. So it's an uh, important part. And the thoughts were, or the so far we think that this um, uh, difference in variation in variance comes from a more robust um, replication in uh, with a D variant. So we have a higher viremia, higher levels of viremia, we have more shedding. This is a virus that spreads easier than the N variant. But what from the get-go of this um, nomenclature, what, what went wrong was that um, many labs reported, started to report um, the N variant as the non- neuropathogenic variant, which has been a mistake, and many of, uh, of the labs kind of uh, turn on that. Uh, we need to make sure everybody understands the, uh, the N variant is less neuropathogenic, but it still can cause uh, neurologic disease. As we have noticed in this, uh, in this um, huge um, Valencia outbreak at that show in Valencia in 2021, Yes, and um, the D variant is more aggressive. It has shown to, um, to uh, create higher magnitude and longer duration of viremia and more shedding um, in uh, under experimental conditions. Um, but they both can cause uh, neurologic disease. Okay, thank you. And we will in the show notes link to an article where we describe the Valencia outbreak in depth, and I believe we interviewed you about it. Moving on, in our conversations, you have mentioned how these headlining outbreaks are pretty rare, though. So what is the perfect storm that causes these more public outbreaks, however rare they are? So public, public outbreaks, at a, which would be at, a, at an event site, at a competition, at a, at a sale, at, uh, but uh, mainly those that became, uh, became famous uh, is uh, Ogden, Utah, a paint horse, a paint horse show in uh, 2011, and uh, Valencia was a big outbreak. And just recently, we had uh, thermal, uh, thermal in California. And the the common denominator of these shows is that horses from uh, several sites come together for a multi-day. Uh, and in case of Valencia, I'm not too aware of the other um, of the other two outbreaks, how long they maintained, but Valencia was several weeks uh, of coming and going onto the site. So um, horses coming and going, uh, different occupation of uh, stalls in a, in a venue like that, crowding maybe, not optimal um, uh, stabling conditions when it comes to uh, um, temporary barn uh, tents, tent mm -hmm. constructions, and we all know they have a, a poorer ventilation than, uh, than other buildings. Uh, and if you look at Valencia, its travel is uh, is a part that um, that is important to consider for a perfect storm. These horses, may, the uh, most of the horses came from northern Europe and traveled all the way down to Spain, which is at least a two to three day travel with um, infrequent breaks. And um, so this is these are risk factors for um, for reactivation of virus. This takes a little bit of time, so it's important that uh, that this is not like a one or two day event and then all horses go home, but uh, you have several days to weeks of uh, competition. 
So you had mentioned the more typical equine herpes virus, one outbreak on the smaller farm or the board, the personal farm or the boarding farm. When EHV-1 unfolds on these farms, what does that typically look like? What does the owner notice first? So first signs, and um, this is like, we looked at uh, several of these um, John Doe outbreaks in Europe, uh, but also here in the United States. And usually the first, um, uh, the, the case one, is very often a horse with um, neurologic disease. So it shows with uh, initially mild ataxia, maybe it has a fever, mild ataxia, and the next day this horse might be recumbent, might be down. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, um, this is the, the, the most common presentation um, of a start of an outbreak uh, on, a, on, a, on a home enterprise. The other um, presentation we some we less frequently um, uh, um, got confronted with is an abortion. So uh, a mare, in, if you have a mixed mixed enterprise, if you have you know a few brood mares spread out among the the other horses, that's 40 horses under one roof, and you have two brood mm -hmm. mares uh, among them. We also had like an abortion where things started with an abortion, and then very often you know you. Well, you accept that there is an abortion, but you don't um, you don't look for the for the cause of the abortion. So that is has been another starting point. And when you are sure. there at this point, uh, you need to make sure that you uh, check for horses that may have incurred um, virus onto the farm because a horse, if it hasn't traveled, it's unlikely that this is the horse that um, that brought in virus from outside or reactivated virus. This is highly sure. unlikely. So uh, look for this other horse. Look look for this horse where um, it's almost like the case zero, if you call the case, the index case, the case one. Then you call, you were looking for your case zero who brought in the problem, maybe without even showing any signs of disease. Other starting points um, are, uh, starting points are that all of a sudden, you notice that your horse has um, stocked up limbs and they're not, not just like one limb because of a, a cellulitis or anything, but four mm -hmm. stocked up limbs. It's typically a sign of a vasculitis in the, in the limbs. There's some edema in there. Uh, so you have um, symmetrical uh, swelling in, in all four mm -hmm. limbs or in two limbs. And then you wonder what's happening. Um, Take fever, take a temperature in these horses to make sure the horse is not febrile. Very often this type of vasculitis goes along with viremia and viremia is um, typically um, associated with a fever in the horse. Okay. So these would be your starting points. Thank you. I'm not sure I had heard about the the swelling recently, the stocking up. I think it's it's a little bit more common in the warm blood horses and in, in the draft horses, and you don't see it hmm. in in all breeds at the same degree. But um, definitely, um, warm blood warm bloods uh, and the warm blood crosses are more prone to develop this type of vasculitis. Hmm. And I had numerous owners that you know they were wondering what was going on. Then they walk around because they hope that with uh, some uh, some movement that the swelling will go down. Then people uh, people stop them and they say, "Why are you walking your horse? What's wrong?" Uh, the mm -hmm. other person is on the horse, for example. While the owners talk, the horses have nose to nose contact, and this mm -hmm. is boom, where your virus jumps from one horse to the other, and it all happened um, happened before. Okay, so where do you generally look in a herpes virus outbreak when there isn't a recent traveler on the farm? Well, so travel is very, very important. Um, and it could be short distance travel, it could be long distance travel. It's also like something, it's a horse that may be new to the barn or there was some level of stress at the other, um, at the, uh, at the other end of this transportation. And maybe you don't even realize that there was travel because the horse just came back from a from a, a riding a clinic or anything, from uh, you know a mile down the road, and you don't notice mm -hmm. that as travel. But it could be very well the incursion of virus through this short distance transportation. So um, if you don't have uh, let's say a direct link to um, the case zero, 
then look again and just ask the questions, what were the contacts of this horse, with which horses did this horse have a contact with, start tracing all the good things we did during uh, corona infection um, management, uh, look for your contact points, um, and uh, it's important that you find that uh, case zero, um, because there could be others in that in that little nidus. If you really can't find anything, you still have to conclude that this horse, which is exceptional and rare, exceptionally rare, that this horse did the whole nine yards. It upregulated, it reactivated virus out of latency for whatever reason, um, and then brought it back into the respiratory tract, multiplied it, um, went through viremia. I think it's it's a rare occasion. In 90% of all my outbreaks, I always found um, a link to a horse that traveled or came from a horse is passing through the through the herd, through you know travel or other means. Okay, and I think many of us have become very familiar with the contact tracing over the past few years. What is the single most important thing owners can do to protect their horses from equine herpes? It's a, it's a very tough and silent disease at the beginning. Um, so I really think the only thing we have um, at the very most um, uh, is actually vaccination. Uh, mm -hmm. Prophylaxis, prophylactic vaccination, uh, aforehand, keep up vaccination schedules, keep these horses vaccinated. And the other advice um, I would have is to achieve uh, the highest possible herd immunity. So um, it's always better if everyone is vaccinated compared to 60%, 50%, 40%, 30%. And I don't, we can't say for sure where the cutoff is, but more is definitely better in that regard. The other thing we can do to protect horses is uh, to avoid unnecessary contacts. And especially with those horses that are um, at risk for uh, reactivation of virus. And these are horses that traveled or are coming from somewhere or passing through. Mm -hmm. That would be my um, my uh, best advice. Do you recommend taking temperatures um, of horses when if they've come home or of all the horses in the barn on a regular basis? What's your recommendation there for monitoring for signs? I think taking temperatures should be like a, a daily part, a, a part of daily routine. So you go to your horse and the first thing you do is um, is to take a temperature and check it's, uh, it is a, a very, um, a very important uh, part of assessment of, of uh, horse health. And it's uh, a red flag to show that something is wrong if uh, the temperature is up. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, definitely, if you have a, a horse that returns from somewhere, my advice would be keep that horse separated. Um, also, new horses, um, new uh, new horses to the to the barn, they should be separated from others. This is not like an, a total isolation and with gowns and everything uh, and, and no contact at all. But we need to be realistic that these are the horses that are uh, forming the the highest risk of reactivation, and we should um, should avoid contacts with those guys. With improved testing and um, uh, rapid diagnostics with EHV1 infections, I would also recommend that you know if you have a high, if, a, if you're a large boarding facility, uh, you have new horses coming into the uh, facility into uh, if they go into some quarantine area first for the first 10 days, they also need to be swabbed and need to be um, um, looked for if they shed virus um, through the respiratory tract, so nasal secretions, definitely a recommendation I would follow. And so if you don't happen to catch an EHV1 case and you have an outbreak in your farm, what would you recommend horse and farm owners do as far as biosecurity if there's already a problem in the population? So um, we mentioned already, we talked a lot about uh, the, the fever, the fever phase and fe taking the temperature of, uh, mm -hmm. of a horse. Um, I think one, um, but it's not like, a, it's not a carte blanche that we will detect uh, any horse which is shedding Fever actually in EHV1 infections in the adult horse, so not in the in the in the youngster, in the yearling horse, where this could be 
the very first encounter with um, uh, EHV1 or EHV4. Um, usually with EHV1 infection, a fever is only associated with that uh, second phase of uh, virus pathogenesis, which means when virus is transported through the bloodstream in those white blood cells, this is like an enormous stimulus of inflammation. And this is when we get the fever. But uh, we know viremia starts after or like a few days after infection. So, and it's easily like two to seven days after infection before we get viremia. Mm -hmm. And only with viremia, we have the fever. And so uh, we will not detect the horse that is shedding, but is, um, uh, is not viremic. We will not detect this horse because it does not have a fever. So, so this is why I stress that these horses at risk um, when they come back home from a, from a trip, uh, and even if they are afebrile, um, they should be considered suspect um, that they might upregulate, reactivate virus and start uh, mm -hmm. spreading into the environment and into the horse population. Now, what, what do we do in the, so we have the, the case one, we have the first, um, we have the first uh, horse that is affected by this disease. We, uh, we make a diagnosis by um, rapid detection. Um, and I always told my students, we need to follow, we need to follow the three eyes of biosecurity. We need to identify a horse that has maybe a problem. We, so it's either that we, um, this is a horse that came back from a, from a transport. Um, it has had a, above, above average um, uh, stress or anything like this uh, encountered prior to the, uh, to the transportation. If we, um, if we have this horse identified and it has a fever, definitely we need to, identify, we, we need to isolate this horse um, right away. We need to take our samples. We need to make sure this horse has not been shedding EHV1 into the environment. Mm -hmm. But then we also have to look at horses in its vicinity. So in uh, the neighboring stalls um, or across the aisle, um, and we have to be careful with exchange between these horses and um, the other horses in other barn aisles. It would be advisable, of, definitely as soon as we have uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of EHV1, then this, this uh, part of the barn has to be closed. But at this early phase, without the, uh, the proper diagnostics, we already have to be careful um, we have to be careful with uh, moving horses around and have free exchange of, um, uh, of contacts here through all the barn aisles. We further need to create barriers um, between horses, you know, just to avoid uh, that transmission via airspace um, as best as we can. And uh, another good advice is to create distance between horses. Distance is our friend. The further apart horses are, the less likely is that virus is able to jump from one horse to the other. This is not an influenza virus. This is not one that carries from one corner of the barn uh, to, the, to the other within seconds or minutes. Mm -hmm. This is um, a slower virus. This is um, a heavier virus. It travels in droplets. Um, so distance definitely is our friend. So you mean even in the, you know, indoors under a roof, if you have a horse like in every other stall versus every stall beside each other, even that would help? Definitely that would help. But of course, we need to be careful that we, um, so we have a, we have, we, we think we have a little cell of horses that may, may have become exposed to EHV1. Um, we should be very careful and not, uh, we should not panic that um, we take the neighbors of the affected horse and put them in another stall in another barn aisle, because then we might transfer an exposed and infected horse and put him into um, a healthy group of horses that has not been exposed yet. So if we isolate, if we thin, um, if we thin out our um, um, our occupancy here in a barn aisle, it has to be very strategic. These horses okay. need to go in a building where they are um, in a separate building. Maybe uh, they should also not go with a with a horse that is the shedder, uh, the identified shedder, because we don't know their status yet. Once their status is confirmed, then we we know more and we know where which horses we can put together. But uh, we have to be very careful and we have to think a lot 
uh, before we um, before we make rearrangements in um, uh, where we put these horses. So aside from not being mindful about where you disperse these horses in a possible EHV1 outbreak, what are some other things owners should not do? Um, maybe some examples of uh, caretakers, shared caretakers, equipment, things like that. First, again, what uh, what I mentioned, don't panic. And uh, the worst thing that can be done is like we we take one horse out of this barn that is um, that is not the uh, the the case one. Um, it's a neighboring horse, and we put this horse into another barn or into another building or into another barn aisle. Uh, this has happened in the past, and this is usually the only way how um, how this disease also travels into um, uh, another operation. It's unlikely that virus travels um, on uh, the, the hands of a farrier. Um, it's unlikely that it travels on a uh, garment or on, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the clothing of, um, sure. of the riding instructor or the veterinarian. Having said that, you know, always biosecurity is always a good thing, washing your hands and changing gowns when you are in an infected situation for sure. But it's the horse, the infected horse that transfers the virus from one property to the other. So um, careful with um, making rearrangements and think twice uh, before you move a horse. This has to be really thought through. We mentioned already the, the barriers to be built, uh, the create mm -hmm. distance. The, the caretakers, of course, assigned to one barn and you go from the, you know, uh, from the, the clean side of the barn to the to the dirty side where your where your case one is and definitely split personnel. Um, one for the unaffected aisle um, is um, uh, unaffected aisle is good uh, and another person for the affected aisle or building personnel um, number of personnel is limited then you need to change clothes in between and avoid uh, uh, intense contact with the horses while you are feeding or mocking out and I can remember in a few past outbreaks where um, some horses were still going out from the affected barns, were going out and doing exercise, for instance. And so is it important um, when horses are in a barn that's affected that they only work with horses that are in that barn? Or how, how much are we concerned about exposure outside the barn, out in, you know, in, in arenas or on a track? Um, it's actually, we don't know for sure. We don't know what the um, transmissibility of viruses, how easy it uh, jumps from one host to the other outside. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it has greater difficulties in, um, in, in crossing, but there is a risk. And there's a risk of, uh, you know, if you have small space, um, small space areas, like, for example, a, a lunging corral that mm -hmm. is roofed or this, which is closed. I think there is a risk that you have droplets that keep hovering in this uh, in this uh, airspace mm. for longer periods of time. So one horse after the other is probably not a good idea. The okay. horse that is uh, coming from an affected barn should be last. That's uh, a safe a safe thing to say. Uh, okay. We don't know exactly how efficient transfer is, but I would avoid it um, uh, as much as we can. Um, however, we also need to understand that horses from affected barn aisles, while they are not showing clinical signs and they may, uh, they may shed virus through the respiratory tract and be not affected uh, otherwise, they also need some form of exercise. Um, I always advise owners to, uh, um, to slow down the level of exercise, hand walking, mm -hmm. um, you know, at least un until several things are under control, let's say the, f the f very first 48 hours, uh, until you know what is going on, why are these horses febrile, is it EHV1, I would kind of slow down exercise levels and then reconvene once we have a clearer view of where virus is and how, it's, how, how it has spread and how many are affected and then reconvene and then design uh, an exercise plan for affected barn versus unaffected barn and also a schedule when these um, these horses um, should exercise. Okay, thank you. So we've been very thorough today, but is there anything else you would like to add to what we've covered that I may have missed in my questions? I think um, 
and we talked about this, um, this is not disease uh, that uh, changed because of a changing virus. Mm -hmm. We know that we have these two strains with uh, maybe more or less um, uh, neuropathogenic potential, but these strains have been around for, uh, you know, for, for decades. So they have caused yeah. disease in the 1970s and not just like uh, starting in the 2000s. Um, I think um, what um, what why we why we see more of these outbreaks? It's first of all because we are much easier with reporting. Um, we have uh, it's in in many states it's a reportable disease, but I also believe that this is the the result that we that you know our uh, boarding facilities they grow in size, they become bigger, and they become. Um, more difficult to manage and to overview. Um, you know, you have 100 horses, 200, 400 horses, sometimes under one roof or in several uh, different uh, units. They all use the same uh, riding arena, indoor, outdoor, the same areas of um, uh, hosing down horses or, you know, cleaning and grooming. And I think we, we need to we need to refocus. We need to focus on um, on uh, our behavior. We need to think and rethink um, what kind of contact should horses have. We should kind of see if we can keep them in small groups together um, and not always with uh, all 100 horses at the same time. There are some uh, boarding facilities, in, uh, especially popular in Europe, where you have like an alternative husbandry of group husbandry and you have herd sizes of 50 or 100 horses uh, in, one, uh, in one premises. So, you know, you need, we need to be a little bit more careful if you put these horses all, um, uh, all together with uh, plentiful of, um, of contact frequencies. And that definitely is a reason, I think, uh, for the increasing numbers of EH1 outbreaks. Thank you so much. So where can listeners learn more about your work, Dr. Goering? Well, I, I wish we would be further with our with our website. It's still a work in progress, but uh, there is um, um, there is a, a website at the Gluck, of course, um, that mm -hmm. is uh, assigned to uh, to our laboratory. It's more like an info: what are we doing? But definitely, there's also an uh, an email address um, where um, questions can be asked. You know, what uh, if you're dealing with an outbreak? Um, I'm more than happy to contact uh, the veterinarian in the field to advise. Um, there's always a, a different a different perspective or different view when you look at, you know, what should we do? What, what are the possibilities? Uh, I can easily then say, like, you know, have you thought of maybe this or that? And this is something that uh, did not come in the first place or it, it it, in the first round, it seems to be uh, something that can can't be done uh, on this particular farm, um, and I'm mm -hmm. more than happy to discuss these things. We're also uh, at the moment uh, in the process of um, writing up um, a, a paper for the um, equine veterinary education, uh, the the journal That's equine great. veterinary education, um, on um, you know aspects and mitigation of outbreaks and um, what are risk factors and how can you counteract that? That's wonderful. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that paper. So thank you so much, Dr. Goring, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. You're welcome. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Zoetis. For more from The Horse, visit thehorse.com, sign up for our e-newsletters, or look for Ask the Horse Live wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. If you like this podcast, please do all the things you would do to support it. Rate, subscribe, review, and share it with your friends. Please join us next time as we talk with the horse industry equine innovators.